This video covers gas exchange and gas transport. The learning objectives that we'll cover are to describe the mechanisms of gas exchange in the lungs and explain the mechanisms of gas transport in the blood. So the first learning objective is to talk about gas exchange in the lungs, focusing on oxygen and carbon dioxide. If we look at the Earth's atmosphere and the air that we breathe, uh, we see that it's mostly nitrogen and oxygen and a little bit of CO2. So this is the gas or air that we breathe in. And these are the partial pressures of the gases that we breathe. So the total air pressure is 760. And so we want to know how much of uh, that total air pressure is due to things like oxygen and carbon dioxide uh, and any gas that's in the atmosphere. So at sea level, the air pressure is 7, 6, 760 millimeters of mercury. If you want to figure out the pressure of each individual gas, you simply have to multiply that value by the percentage of gas in the air. So for oxygen, there's 21% of our air and that we breathe is oxygen. So we multiply 0 0.21 times 760, and we get a value of about 160 millimeters of mercury. We call that the partial pressure for oxygen, or PO2. So that's how we talk about the amount of oxygen in our body, in our blood, and in our air. There's very little CO2. The partial pressure for CO2 in the air we breathe is only about 0 0.3. And most of the air pressure is due to nitrogen gas, which we won't talk much about. So it's interesting that the lower you are in altitude and the closer you are to sea level, the more air pressure there is. The higher you are in the atmosphere, the less air, less air pressure there is. So at sea level, air pressure, atmospheric pressure is about 760. If you go up high in a mountaintop, say 15,000 feet, it's about 430 millimeters of mercury. So you see we're getting less. And then at cruising altitude, the air outside your airplane at 30,000 feet is only 230 millimeters of mercury. So the atmospheric oxygen percentage is always 21%. So if we take 0 0.21 and multiply it by our atmospheric pressure, we can calculate our PO2. At sea level, it's 160. High on a mountaintop at 15,000 feet, it's only 90. And at cruising altitude in the air outside your airplane, it's only 50 millimeters of mercury. So we see that the oxygen is about one third. Luckily, your air cabin is pressurized to simulate a lower altitude inside your plane. So the PO2, or oxygen levels, are steadily reduced as we move away from sea level. So PO2 is reduced at higher altitude. This means that there's less oxygen for you to breathe. Normally, our inspired air will have a PO2 of about 160 millimeters of mercury and a very low PCO2 of 0.3. What about the air once it gets down into our lungs? Well, assuming you're ventilating normally and you moisturize the air when you breathe in, the values actually change slightly. The PO2 will be 100 in our lungs and the PCO2 will be 40. We call that air alveolar air. That alveolar air is deep in your lungs. And those alveolar partial pressures are important because the blood then equalizes with those partial pressures. As the blood leaves the lung and goes back to the heart, we call that arterial blood, the PO2 will be the same as the alveolar levels. So the PO2 of your arterial blood is typically 100 and the PCO2 40. And that blood circulates around your body. So normally the alveolar air partial pressures and the arterial partial pressures are the same. They're equal due to the diffusion of oxygen into your blood and the diffusion of CO2 out of your blood. And that diffusion is constantly taking place as your heart pumps the blood through the lungs. If we look at the air in one of our tiny little air sacs or alveolus, we can see that the PO2 in the air is 100. The PO2 in the liquid of the blood coming through there, through the lung in the alveolar capillary is actually lower at 40. This causes a diffusion gradient from high partial pressure to low partial pressure, and so oxygen diffuses from the air into the liquid of our blood. If we look at CO2, the partial pressure of CO2 in the alveolar air is actually lower than the PCO2 of the blood entering the lungs, and so we have a diffusion gradient from our blood liquid 
and into the alveolar air, that diffusion is just the random movement of CO2 molecules from a high partial pressure to a low partial pressure in the alveolar air. So whenever we talk about gases, rather than talking about concentrations, we'll just talk about partial pressures. Partial pressure of oxygen is the PO2, partial pressure of carbon dioxide is PCO2. If we have a glass of water, or a bottled, uh, I think a bottled water, and we want to know how much O2 is in that water, we can look at the partial pressure in the air, which we know is 160, and so that will cause oxygen to diffuse into that water, and so the PO2 of that water, or that bottled water, or glass of water, will equalize. Whatever the PO2 in the air is, they will equalize, so 160 or 100 or 50 and 50. So again, our atmospheric PO2 is about 160. This is due to diffusion. The partial pressures will always equalize between the gas and the liquid. And when we talk about the lung, it's a partial pressure of about 100. And so the fluid leaving the lung uh, will usually end up at a partial pressure of 100 as well. The other thing that helps determine how much uh, gas will go from air into liquid is the solubility of that gas in the liquid. And it turns out that water and plasma, since it's mostly water, has a fairly low solubility for oxygen. So oxygen, even though the PO2 is equalized, not a lot of oxygen molecules like to get into that water or into that plasma. Carbon dioxide, on the other hand, has a higher solubility in water. So when we look at carbon dioxide, there'll be actually more carbon dioxide dissolved in the liquid, for example, the plasma of our blood, uh, because it has a higher solubility in water, even though sometimes the PCO2 is lower. And we'll see why that's important later. All right, so we have this diffusion of gases either from our air into our blood or from our blood into the air due to the partial pressures. So if we look at oxygen, Remember, our liquid blood runs through our lung, through those capillaries. All the while, oxygen starts diffusing into that liquid, into the blood, until the partial pressures equalize and then diffusion is, is done. Because the blood spends enough time in the lung as it's pumped through, the partial pressure equalizes between the lung air and the blood liquid. If we look at CO2, and look at the partial pressure changes in CO2, again, the blood goes through the lungs. The blood has higher CO2 when it starts off in the lung, and now it uh, gives off CO2 to the air in the lung through diffusion until those partial pressures equalize. And again, they almost always equalize in a healthy lung. So we have our alveolar air, we have our blood coming into our lungs through these little alveolar capillaries. The blood rushes through those alveolar capillaries and for a split second or so, uh, it's in close contact with the alveolar air. So this is enough time for oxygen to diffuse into our capillary and those partial pressures equalize. So if the partial pressure is 100 in the air, the, the blood leaving the lung will have a partial pressure of 100. So our PO2 in the alveolar air and the blood leaving the lung will be the same. If we look at CO2, remember the blood coming into the lung has higher levels of CO2, and so we actually have diffusion of CO2 into that air until the partial pressures equalize, and they do. And then the lung leaving, or excuse me, the blood leaving the lung will have the same partial pressure as the air. And this is just a summary to show us the values. So again, the PO2 and PCO2 of the air in your lungs determines the PCO2 and PO2 of the blood leaving the lung. So the partial pressures will always equalize uh, in a healthy lung. The alveolar values and the blood leaving the lung will become equal in terms of partial pressure, PO2 and PCO2. So what are some normal expected values in a healthy breathing person? So again, a PO2 in the lungs of 100, 
The PO2 entering the lungs, our venous blood, is only 40. The PO2, once we leave the lung, we'll call that arterial blood because it's heading back to our heart and our aorta, will become 100 because it equalizes. If we look at PCO2, the venous blood going to the lungs has only 46, uh, but the PCO2 in the lung is 40. So the arterial blood leaving the lung and being pumped through our body will have a PCO2 of 40. So again, I'm just pointing out that the alveolar and the arterial blood, PCO2 and PO2, will always equalize. They'll always be equal. Let's look at how these would change if you hold your breath. So if you stopped ventilating for 30 seconds and held your breath, what would happen to the alveolar oxygen and CO2 levels and therefore your arterial PO2 and PCO2? So let's hold our breath and see what would happen. So if we hold our breath, well, let's look at the normal values first. So again, we always expect it to be 140. If we hold our breath, we're not ventilating, so we're not getting new oxygen in and we're not getting CO2 out. So our PO2 goes down and our PCO2 goes up. Remember, we're pumping blood to our lungs to pick up oxygen and drop off CO2, and those values will always equalize. So now our arterial blood going through our body will be low in oxygen and high in CO2. Of course, we know our brain won't like that. Our medulla will sense the high CO2, and the carotids will send back information about oxygen, and together those will cause the brain to want to breathe. Another example would be if you hypoventilate, maybe due to damage to your brain or drugs or alcohol. Again, if the lung levels change, then our arterial levels change. So in this case, low oxygen and high CO2 because we're hypoventilating. What happens to alveolar and arterial levels if you hyperventilate? So if you start breathing more than your metabolism requires, what will happen to those values? So let's look at that next. So if you're hyperventilating, you're ventilating more, so you're breathing off more CO2 and you're breathing in more O2. So now we look at the lung changes and the arterial changes. Our oxygen levels are higher than normal. Our CO2 levels are lower than normal. This might allow you to hold your breath longer if you're a swimmer or diver, but it also might make your brain dizzy, and one of the reasons for that are the low CO2 levels cause vasoconstriction of arterials and change your, bra your brain's blood flow. So let's look at some uh, examples that we might encounter. So if you have a patient, and we measure that your patient's arterial blood uh, blood gases, so PO2 and PCO2, and we notice that their oxygen levels are low at 90 and their PCO2 is high at 52, what could be causing that? So remember, those are abnormal values. There are some possibilities, so let's look. So some of the issues could be with your lungs, for example, COPD, or you might have pulmonary edema. These can mess up your arterial blood gases. So again, remember, normally under normal conditions, the alveolar levels and the blood levels equalize because of diffusion. So sometimes you can get pulmonary edema. It can be caused by heart failure, uh, sometimes a heart attack, even high altitude. So fluid backs up in the lungs and you get the swelling or edema in the lung tissue and this makes it hard for diffusion to occur because there's too much fluid in there and too much distance to diffuse. So if you have that edema in the lungs, you, you don't have good diffusion of oxygen uh, and potentially CO2. So that decreases the PO2 levels circulating around in your body, decreases your PO2. In cases of COPD and emphysema and chronic bronchitis, in those cases you're having problems ventilating the lung and you have bad gas exchange. So again, you screw up the PO2 and the PCO2 levels in your body. So in this case, we'd have higher than normal CO2 and lower than normal oxygen floating around in the arteries going throughout your body.
So I wanted to mention the condition called dyspnea, and this is when people feel shortness of breath or the feeling like they can't catch their breath or tightness in their chest. This can often be caused by COPD and pulmonary edema. Again, our brain's quest for homeostasis involves regulating our ventilation, increasing and decreasing your ventilation so that your alveolar O2 and CO2 levels are normal, which then keeps your arterial levels of oxygen and CO2 in that homeostatic range. You may see people who are climbing very high mountains wearing an oxygen mask. And so, for example, if you're going to climb Mount Everest, the atmospheric air, air pressure is 230. We still have our 21% oxygen, but when you multiply those together, you get a very low inspired PO2. The inspired PO2 at that elevation is 50. And so once you breathe that air into your body, uh, and actually get the alveolar PO2, it's actually less than 50. And so the arterial PO2 in these climbers would be less than 50. They use supplemental oxygen though to keep their inspired PO2 higher. So at very high altitude, the low air pressure decreases the inspired PO2, which decreases the amount of oxygen in your body. This stimulates ventilation so that you breathe harder and faster and increase your ventilation. What about if you climb a mountain that's uh, not quite as high as Mount Everest, something you might find in Arizona or California? So a 10,000 foot mountain would have an inspired PO2 that's still lower, about 109. Once that gets into your lungs, the PO2 is about 70. So now our arterial PO2 is lower. The carotid peripheral chemoreceptors in the carotid arteries will send that information about your low oxygen back to your medulla, which stimulates increased ventilation. And so you'll increase your tidal volume and your respiratory rate during both rest and exercise. Hopefully that increased ventilation or hyperventilation will bring your PO2 back up towards normal. Maybe not quite all the way, but at least close enough to make you feel better. The next learning objective is to explain the mechanisms of gas transport in the blood. And specifically, we'll look at oxygen and carbon dioxide. So the take-home summary here is that oxygen is transported bound to hemoglobin in your red blood cells, while carbon dioxide is actually uh, chemically converted to something called bicarbonate ions, or HCO3-. And so that's how we transport the major gases in our blood. So one of the things to keep in mind, if we look at air exposed to liquid like plasma or water, and we talk about body temperature, and we look at the amount of oxygen dissolved in those, we'll get a PO2 of 100. The PO2s will equalize. But because oxygen has a very, very low solubility in water and in plasma, we won't actually have a lot of oxygen content in, the, in those samples, in the plasma or in the water. So that's a problem for us because we need oxygen for our cells. So the low oxygen solubility means we have low amounts of oxygen in plasma and in water. That wouldn't be good for our cells or our body. So the way we sort of overcome that, uh, you might already know, is to have red blood cells. And to have those red blood cells packed with an oxygen carrier called hemoglobin. So our solution for this low oxygen solubility in plasma is simply to add red blood cells packed with hemoglobin and that hemoglobin binds up oxygen it doesn't change the amount of dissolved oxygen but now we have a bunch of bound oxygen in our red blood cells and this increases the oxygen content in our blood so the oxygen uh, dissolved is still the same when you have red blood cells but now we have lots and lots of bound oxygen and that O2 carrier again is hemoglobin So if we look at samples of blood, or if we just look at plasma, we see that plasma has a PO2 of 100, but a very low oxygen content. But if we add red blood cells and hemoglobin, we still have a PO2 of 100, but now we have lots and lots of oxygen uh, bound to hemoglobin in our red blood cells. So the more red blood cells, the more oxygen content we have in our blood. If we don't have enough red blood cells, then we won't have enough oxygen content. And just as a review, hemoglobin is a protein, 
prote uh, hemoglobin has uh, this heme molecule that has iron which can reversibly bind oxygen. Each hemoglobin protein has four hemes and each heme can bind an oxygen. So each hemoglobin can bind four oxygen molecules. And these are packed into your red blood cells so that we can carry oxygen around our body. And luckily it's a reversible binding so we can pop the oxygen on and off. Due to the heme, each, each hemoglobin having four hemes, we can only bind four uh, oxygens to each hemoglobin. That's the maximum amount. At an expected arterial PO2 of 100, our hemoglobins are fully saturated with their four little oxygens. So they're carrying as much oxygen as they can at a PO2 of 100 millimeters of mercury. You can't carry any more oxygen inside those red blood cells, even if you increase the amount of oxygen dissolved uh, and increase the PO2. So at our typical expected arterial PO2, our hemoglobin is 100% saturated uh, with oxygen. If we decrease the PO2 to 40, which we expect in venous blood, now the hemoglobin are less saturated with oxygen. They're only about 70% saturated. So they're only carrying maybe two or three oxygen molecules for each hemoglobin. So now we have less bound oxygen, and also that changes the color of the hemoglobin pigment uh, to a darker red. We can actually use something called a pulse oximeter to tell how saturated your hemoglobin and your red blood cells are uh, by simply looking at the color of your blood. So it shoots a laser beam light through your fingertip and actually detects the color of your red blood cells and then estimates how much oxygen you have by looking at the saturation. Most of the time, most of us healthy will have 100% or 98% saturation but we don't really know the oxygen content using that. Okay, so again, to point out, when your PO2 is about 100, uh, you're 100% saturated. Even if we decrease the PO2 all the way down to 60 millimeters of mercury, the hemoglobin is still 90% saturated. So um, that's a pretty good saturation. So that helps in homeostasis. Even if we have large changes in arterial PO2, we still keep a fairly stable saturation of our, our hemoglobin. So one thing to keep in mind, at our normal PO2 in our lungs and in our arteries, we have hemoglobin in our red blood cells that are about 98% saturated with oxygen. Meaning those little red blood cells in the hemoglobin is carrying about all the oxygen that it can carry. You can't really pack any more oxygen into those red blood cells. Even if we increase the PO2 that you breathe to 100%, which gives you about a 600 millimeter of mercury of PO2 of oxygen, you really can't get any more oxygen onto those little red blood cells. You can dissolve some more oxygen in the blood, but you can't pack any more bound to hemoglobin. So a healthy person, it won't really help to breathe 100% oxygen. But if you take a diseased lung and somebody whose arterial PO2 is reduced because of COPD or ventilation problems or edema, and you put them on 100% oxygen, well, they can actually improve their percentage, their, their hemoglobin saturation, and they can improve the amount of bound oxygen circulating around. So the idea of breathing 100% oxygen for a healthy per patient and a healthy person won't really do much. But for a diseased lung or a patient that has a low PO2, it'll actually help them circulate and carry more oxygen around the body. And you'll see patients sometimes on supplemental oxygen. Let's look at some examples where we change some variables and see how this changes the oxygen content uh, in our blood. So again, the normal PO2 is about 100. We get some dissolved oxygen, but not much. And then we get, uh, hopefully, the expected high amount of bound oxygen bound to hemoglobin in our blood cells. And this gives us our typical oxygen content of blood, say about 20 mils of oxygen per little drop of blood. Our red blood cells and those hemoglobin molecules will be fully saturated with oxygen.
if we suddenly increase our PO2 to 200 and double it, you might think we carry more oxygen in our blood. But unfortunately, the bound oxygen and the hemoglobin in red blood cells are already maxed out. And we can maybe dissolve a little more oxygen in our blood, but not much at all. So we don't really change our oxygen content much by changing the PO2 above 100, again, for a healthy person. What if we want to increase the oxygen content? Well, again, our PO2 of 100 is our normal expected value. One of the easiest ways to increase the oxygen content is simply to increase the hemoglobin content and the amount of red blood cells. So if we do that, we add more red blood cells, we make more red blood cells, we pack those with hemoglobin, now we can actually carry lots and lots more oxygen bound. So we're not really changing the dissolved oxygen levels at all but we've increased the bound oxygen bound to hemoglobin. So now we have much more oxygen content floating around in each drop of blood. So the best way to increase your oxygen content is simply to increase your amount of red blood cells, which increases your hemoglobin and increases the bound uh, levels of oxygen in your blood. So more hemoglobin, more red blood cells, more oxygen content. Same PO2 and same dissolved oxygen. Let's add, look at anemia. So remember, anemia is when you have less red blood cells than normal because you're not making them or maybe they're destroyed. So if you have decreased red blood cells and decreased hemoglobin, your PO2 will be normal. Your dissolved amount of oxygen, that'll be the same as always. But now you have less bound oxygen because you have less red blood cells. Since your bound oxygen levels are very low now or lower now, your oxygen content will be lower than normal. So anemia is a problem with your oxygen content in your blood due to something causing that decreased red blood cells, uh, either destruction or production. So again, anemia is really a problem with reduced amount of red blood cells uh, or hemoglobin. How do you get rid of anemia? Well, you're going to need more red blood cells and more hemoglobin. So the problem with anemia is that you have reduced red blood cells or hemoglobin, which reduces the oxygen content in your blood. And of course, we like oxygen for our cells. I just wanted to remind you that your kidneys can sense this low oxygen, produce a hormone called erythropoietin, which targets your hematopoietic stem cells and stimulates them to make more red blood cells. If you have more red blood cells, you can carry more oxygen. You may have heard of carbon monoxide poisoning, and I wanted just to talk a little bit about how that affects uh, oxygen transport. So carbon monoxide can come from smoke, uh, cigarettes, uh, sometimes invisible gases, non-combustible uh, gases and things like that. So you inhale carbon monoxide and that carbon monoxide then goes in, dissolves in your plasma, and then it actually displaces oxygen. It has a higher affinity for hemoglobin than oxygen. So oxygen can't get on that hemoglobin and you can't carry as much oxygen around your body. So carbon monoxide is very da dangerous because it basically replaces oxygen on your hemoglobin. So carbon monoxide gas, if it replaces your hemoglobin or replaces your oxygen, uh, you really don't have good oxygen content, which could actually lead to uh, unconsciousness and even uh, death. So next we're going to talk about carbon dioxide transport. And it turns out you do not need hemoglobin in order to transport carbon dioxide. Turns out carbon dioxide dissolves pretty well in plasma and because it has a higher solubility in water uh, than, say, oxygen. So carbon dioxide is able to dissolve into your plasma, and then actually we'll talk about how it's carried here. So remember, your cells make lots and lots of CO2 through metabolism. That CO2 diffuses into your plasma, some of that CO2 is then going to move into your red blood cells. And inside your red blood cells is, a, is an enzyme, which is a protein. And that enzyme can actually chemically convert CO2 into bicarbonate. 
And so first it makes it into this carbonic acid, but basically we get HCO3 minus, which is bicarbonate. These little bicarbonate ions are then shuttled into your plasma, and that's how we carry most of our CO2 in our bloodstream is as bicarbonate. So CO2 transport is primarily bicarbonate ions. A little bit, or some of it, still just dissolved as CO2 floating around in the plasma. So we really don't need hemoglobin at all in order to transport CO2. We just transport it as HCO3 minus bicarbonate and some dissolved as CO2. This requires this protein called carbonic anhydrase, which is found inside your red blood cells which uses some chemical magic uh, to change that, that CO2 to bicarbonate. Once we get to the lungs, though, we're going to want to breathe off that CO2. So you might wonder, well, how do I breathe off the CO2 if it's bicarbonate? Well, luckily, once we get into the lungs, the concentration gradient changes so that bicarbonate is converted back to CO2 by that carbonic anhydrase. The CO2 then diffuses from your plasma into the air in your alveoli and you can breathe it out. So a little bit of chemistry 101. Carbon dioxide again can be chemically converted to bicarbonate ions but also hydrogen ions in this reaction if you follow it through. So if we have lots of CO2 we chemically convert it to bicarbonate ions to carry it around but we also make a little hydrogen ion as well which we're going to see can affect our pH. If we have lots of bicarbonate ions, then we can shift it the other way to CO2, and then we can breathe that CO2 out in our lungs. So this is a totally reversible reaction thanks to carbonic anhydrase. So earlier I said there was a link between CO2 and pH. So one of the things I want you to remember is when you have more CO2, you make more hydrogen ions chemically. If you have more hydrogen ions, that reduces your pH, which we call acidic. All right, so more CO2, a lower pH. If you were to hold your breath for a long time and your CO2 went up, that would make your pH go down. Again, because you made all those little hydrogen ions. So one of the things that could cause your CO2 levels to increase in your body and to screw up your pH would be hypoventilation. So if you hypoventilate, that's going to cause the production of these hydrogen ions, which can cause acidosis and make your pH fall out of the sort of homeostatic range. So luckily we can get rid of CO2 out of our lungs uh, and that helps then regulate our body's pH. Normally we're always breathing out CO2 but if we hypoventilate our CO2 goes up and our hydrogen ion levels go up and our pH goes down. If we hyperventilate our CO2 levels go down and therefore our pH actually goes up. And if we flash back to when we talked about hypoventilation, say you overdosed on drugs and you stop breathing as much as you should, your CO2 levels go up, which is going to decrease our pH or cause an acidosis in our body and in our bloodstream. If for some reason you hyperventilate from stress or high altitude, if you look what happens to your CO2, it goes down because you're blowing off more CO2. As CO2 goes down, that's going to actually cause your pH to go up, which we call alkalosis. And again, that can happen in your bloodstream. When you're in high altitude, remember, you're hyperventilating because of that low oxygen level telling you to breathe. Okay, that is it. I will see you guys in class.